this message is, uh, you know, I always seem to have a disclaimer. I don't know why, I guess because I like to uh, present it, I guess, in a in an introductory way to kind of get you prepared for it. But this message is a very, it's a strong warning. It's a harsh warning. And it seems to me that the Word of God is getting stronger, not just by me, but by other watchmen and pastors who are listening to God, because I believe the intensity of life, the birth pangs, the absolute pressure that we're facing is evidential and is not waning and going down. In fact, it's ever increasing. And the reason for the intensity is because of the close proximity of the coming of the ages, the finishing of the ages, the coming of the king. And we have to recognize and realize that as believers that life does not continue to roll in the American way that we've always been taught. It rolls the way the Bible says it rolls. And we don't have the ability to change that. Though we think we do, we have the power to vote, we have the power of money and the power of persuasion But I want you to know you can't persuade prophecy, and you cannot manipulate God. What he's determined and written, it is so, and it will be. So I received this word from the Lord, again, that will be very strong and very pointed, and I am believing will shake many to their core of their spiritual relationship with God, because it's the hour and the time of getting closer to him than we ever have. I told you this month of September will be a month to remember and a month of sanctification. I don't know if you're taking the time, but I pray that you are and having inventory with God. So I said all that to lay this groundwork out for this particular message that if you are of somebody of weak feelings and things bother you, you should probably go home now or shut me off because I'm going to lay it like it should be. Here's what the Lord said. He said, America, can a man take fire unto his bosom and not be burned? Can a nation practice strange fire and not be consumed? Your false worship and your pagan practices have kindled the fire of my anger and great displeasure. Your vows are cankered and tainted by your betrayal. Your bread is molded. Your waters are stale, stagnant, and diseased. The plagues of Egypt are upon you. The cure and the remedy offered to you is no longer your medicine. Listen to this, your mockery of the cure of the cross has become your curse. Leprosy will be your garments of mourning. The plagues of Egypt are here. Your strange fire will illuminate and guide you into the lake of fire. Woe, I say unto those who enter the second death. To my church, check your censors daily. See if you're offering strange fire. Look and see what consumes you. Judge yourself lest you be judged by me. Watch this. For he said, I will consume you with my jealous fire. It is written, I have I will have no other gods before me. Shun those who offer you strange fire, lest my anger be released upon you. Father God, thank you for this message today that I know will be heavy and hard, but I know it will be liberating for those that have ears to hear, and I believe many will come into the kingdom of God today, and many will make a decision towards Christ. I believe that today. 
May the power of the cross and the convicting truth of the Holy Spirit be in operation in this message. Send it, Father, deep into the hearts of your people. Let their hearts be like grass and your words like fire. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Definitely strong words and words that you need to go back and listen to again and to pray over. The title of this message that he gave me is called Welcome, Welcome to the Church of the Strange Fire. Welcome to the Church of the Strange Fire. This is exactly the way he spoke to me. Because we're living in a time and a season where the church is offering strange fire to God. Now, you must understand what strange fire is. And strange fire is a type of worship that is unholy. It's profane absolutely profane it's an unauthorized worship it is also in definition used as prostitution and adultery it's strange and the reason why the church is offering strange fires because they don't know what pure fire is They don't know what pure worship is because we've been tainted by our modern theologians and our liberal theologians who tell us that we can live loosely as long as we give largely. I wish that somebody helped me. As long as we punch the clock and show up at church, we've did our time with the good old man upstairs and everything's going to be fine. When the reality is, no, it's a heart after God full of passion and desire to know him that is a true believer. A disciple is a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a church attendee. Anybody can attend church. The devil does. Don't look at your neighbor, but he could be sitting next to you. You just don't know. And so welcome to the Church of Strange Fire, because in America, that's exactly what we have all over this nation. It's very hard to find pure-hearted believers today that love God and churches that are just seeking after Him. And we're not talking about methodologies of worship, because we'll never have the same methodology. It just doesn't work, because we're individuals you want to follow diversity you can follow diversity in that way and that's okay that's just the way it is but there's some doctrinal truths that we have disregarded and we have kicked to the curb if you will and replaced it with modern cultural acceptance such as homosexuality and lesbianism and alcoholism and vices that are all through the churches that we think it's okay whether it's prescription drugs not for medical reasons but for psychological reasons because you can't handle life and it becomes recreational to you is anybody with me that you chase it down with just a little bit of wine for the stomach's sake And now it becomes an addiction. Now it becomes part of the tainted relationship you have with God. And it becomes strange fire. And you come into the house of God with dirty hands and a dirty heart. We're not talking about somebody who just trips up and falls into the puddles of life. Because we all get dirty. But I'm talking about workers of iniquity. I'm talking about people who know what sin is and you won't get rid of it. But then you come into the house and you say, holy, you ain't fooling nobody. I said, you're not fooling anybody. And you're offering strange fire. And I'm telling you, it's very dangerous, America. Because that strange fire that you're offering is going to turn on you. And we're going to talk about that. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus, You said, oh, my God, what happened to Jeremiah? Leviticus. Leviticus. 
what is he going to preach on in Leviticus? Do you even know where Leviticus is? It's in the Bible. That's why somebody tried to get smart with me. He says, where is such and such at? I said, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know all the addresses. I just know it's there. Leviticus chapter 10. Let's talk about that. And you have to look at verse chapter 9 and see what happened. And Moses is the man of God. Let's get that straight. He was the man, the B-M-O-C, the big man on the campus. But all the time that there is a big man, a person in charge, there's always got to be someone that wants to be bigger and better and better. It's called rebellion. It's called, I know more than you, pastor. I know more than you, deacon. I know more than you, elders. And I know more than you. I went to one day of Bible school. Somebody help me. I read it in the magazine, and now you know it all. I love those people. I just love them. And so Moses was demonstrating the power of God and how the fire of God came and consumed the sacrifice, and it was an amazing thing, an amazing sight to see God amen Moses. God will amen a church. I said, God will confirm a church. God will vindicate a pastor. He'll vindicate a woman of God, a man of God. He will show you and others who he's approving of. He just does. And our God answers by fire. He's an all-consuming fire. And so he demonstrated his powers. You can go back in chapter 9 and see that. And then here comes the sons of Aaron. The copycats, the ones that want to be like Moses. They want to be like the pastor. They want to be like the leader. They want to usurp the authority of God because they're the sons of. Oh, you're a son of. I'm a son of. I'm a part of. I'm an inheritance. I, 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 my grandpappy was a part of the church and, and then the committee, and they built the building and the seats that you're sitting on and the pews that you are pewing on <laughs> for all the old church. All those things, we're, we've been a part of it, and we have the same authority. We've got the same power. We've got the same ability. We know how to run church. Oh, we don't need this manual called the Bible. We have culture. We have philosophies. We have doctrines of men, actually doctrines of demons. We have the ability to articulate. We can preach and we look well and we sound well and our, our sound is pleasing to the people and the sight is pleasing to the people and all these things are in are enchantments to the people. Look who we are. We're the sons of Aaron. And so in chapter 10, they get their opportunity to be the BMOCs, the big boys. Verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu. I found this very funny as I was researching. <laughs> Nadab means liberal. I said, Lord, you got a sense of humor. It's always them liberals. And he said, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them the, his censer. What is that? It's a pot that they use to use incense in. It's basically in reference to your heart. That's why God told us in the Word, check your censer. Are you burning strange fire today? He said, take the censer and put fire therein and put therein upon and uh, uh, incense. Now watch this. They were supposed to put fire that came from the altar of God 
in Leviticus chapter 6 or so, he gives an explicit instruction. This is how you worship me. This is how you come to me. I don't want you to come to me any other way. I don't want you to come to me in your culture. I don't want you to come to me in your philosophies. I don't want you to come to me in your opinions. I don't want you to come to me in your excuses. I don't want you to come to me in anything other than the way I tell you to worship me. And that is absolute. But see, we don't preach that today because if you preach that today, then it sounds like you're being uh, demandive and you're being robotic and you're making somebody in a, a, a position to where they feel like they're being controlled. When the reality is it has nothing to do with the methodology, it has everything to do with the heart. And he was trying to bring them to a place of understanding this is how I want to be worshipped. And I don't understand today's church other than that we've polluted and we have perverted what God said he wanted. Then we get this slop together of whatever our lives are and whatever our churches are and whatever our pastors are brewing in the back room and we throw it on a plate like a dog to God and say, eat of it. Here's my offering. This is the best I can give. I can barely get my B-U-T-T -T in the house, but here I am. I love you. Huh? It's the truth. You ought to be glad I'm here, and I know that's the attitude because that's the way people treat pastors. That's exactly how people treat the church. Well, I got here, didn't I? Woohoo! Glad you made it, bud. What you going to do that before an almighty God when it's Ron yonder time and call up the roll time? You're just going to show up and slide in and just say, here I am, splish, splash. I don't think so. By the time you get done sucking carpet, is anybody here and God says, lift your head up? Is it? See, we don't see that because we're arrogant. We're self-centered. We're self-righteous. Our name's written in the land's book of life, and you can't do a D-A-M thing about it. Is this good enough for you? Because that is the attitude of the American church. That is exactly how the church feels about God. Because we feel that way about each other. We feel that way about politics. We feel that way about law and order. We feel that way about everything. You know it's the truth. And if we can do that with those we see, then how would we treat that one we can't see? With much disdain, my friends, much disdain does the church treat an almighty God. You talk like he's not even in the room. You think like he doesn't even exist in your mind. Brother, he's there. You want him when you need something. You want him as your great physician when your body's sick, but you sit there and let your mind run around and become a playground for playboys. Right. You know it's the truth. How about some playgirls? It's the truth, and we don't focus on this, and we don't have preachers that will come and talk to us this way because we want to be candy-coated. We're afraid to say anything. They're going to take their nickels and their noses. Well, you can take both of them because at the end of the day, in the end of your life, when you're finished on your breathing count, I don't know what that number is. When the day you take your last breath and you stand before an almighty God, you will be judged for what you've done. And you ain't going to point your little bony finger at me. I'm going to warn you, and I'm warning you today. If you've got strange fire in your life, get it out. If you're prostituting your mind, get it out. If you're playing the whore in your mind, get it out. And in your heart, get it right with God. Because there is coming a day you will stand before him if you make it. So you're trying to scare me. No, I'm going to let the word talk to you. I, I don't have the ability. 
When I pray my prayers before I come in this place, I say, God, I don't have the ability to move a man anywhere. I can't move anybody with my words. I don't have that ability. But, oh, Holy Ghost, you can convict us. You can bring us to the place again where we can cry out to you, and that self-righteous statue that we've built can be destroyed. May the gods of Dagon fall in your life. That's what I pray for the Church of America. And if this doesn't apply to you, just smile and look at me. Just put your fangs back up and smile and pray for those that it does. Are you still in Leviticus? Well, come on. Verse 1. And Nadab, liberal, I love it. And Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire thereon and put the incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. I told you not to do this. But they did it anyways. How many times in our Christian life do we do against what God has said and to you and to God that strange fire? See, this is what we're trying to get at today through the power of the Holy Ghost, that when you live outside your world and you do what you want to do, Watch this now. In here don't mean nothing to me. Anybody, anybody can put on the Christian mask. In fact, that's what you do. But when the lights are out and there ain't nobody home, come on, somebody. It's just you and the Holy Ghost. We don't know who you really are. Is anybody here? The thoughts, the intents of the heart that's what God is looking for, and that which is inside of you becomes deeds out of you. In other words, you do what you think. As a man thinks his heart, so is he. As he ponders, so he plans. That's how sin is developed. It's planned, and then it's acted upon. And that strange fire is brought before the for God and you come into the sanctuary of God and God says I commanded you not to do that so to you and to me meaning God it is strange it's 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 wrong and profane but again we don't teach this we don't preach this we don't live this therefore we don't obey God watch what he says and what she commanded them, I told you not to do this. See, you, you say that today, church, and people get all mad and ruffled. How dare you? I'll do what I want to do. I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Do what you want to do. But I'm just telling you, at the end of the, your days, you're going to find out you can't do what you wanted to do. You're going to find out you shouldn't have done what you wanted to do. That holiness is the way to God. And holy, this ain't got nothing about what you wear. You can, you can wear a, a, a dress to the end of your fingernails and be the biggest witch in the room. So don't give me that. I'm not a clothesline preacher. But I will tell you this, your heart will determine how you look on the outside. That's a fact. And that's holiness. Holiness is a relationship with God. Holiness is separating myself and doing all that I can to not walk in sin. And if I do, I have an advocate. If I do, I have an intercessor. If I do, I have a judge that will judge me in mercy now rather than for me to hide it and then I face him in judgment. He's a merciful God. I say he's merciful and we've misconstrued the message of holiness. We've misconstrued all of this. And we've allowed strange fire to run through our churches. Watch this, verse 2. And then they went out f fire from the Lord. <laughs> you want some fire? Here's some fire. They got some fire, didn't they? And the fire from the Lord devoured them, and they... Oh, what happened? They died before the Lord. Are you here today? 
See, here's the problem, the arrogancy of the American church today and the church of the 21st century is that because we don't see this happening necessarily in public view, in public square, we think that God has changed his mind and he doesn't get angry anymore and he won't judge. Honey, he does judge. There's a reason why people are checking out early. You can blame it on the jab. You can blame it on this. You can blame it on that. You can blame it on drugs. You can blame it on violence. You can blame it on war. You can blame it on anything you want to blame it on. But when God says you're done, you're done. And it's amazing how many people are being done and young and of all ages and stages of life. No matter how much money you got, I don't care if you're an actor, don't care if you're a singer or a sports star, it don't matter if you're the biggest stud on campus, it is in the hands of God your whole life. And man doesn't believe that. Even in the church, we just think we just want to skate and do what we want to do, and grace covers us all. No, you can only frustrate grace for so long. But I'm telling you and I'm warning you as we move through these months and move into next year, you're going to see that protection of grace to begin to leave the church and instant judgment will come to the house of God. It's already happening, but it's going to happen in public display. God will get his glory. God will get his name glorified among his people. And you say, well, that's a scare tactic. All I can tell you is wait and see. All I can tell you is I wouldn't be on the side of strange fire. I would check my heart. I would check my censor. I would check my incense. I would check my worship and say, God, if there be anything in me that's unclean, remove it from me. If there's anything that offends you, remove it from me. If there's anything profane, remove it from me. If I hurt and harmed anybody, forgive me. Father God, let me forgive those who hurt me. Let bitterness not be a part of my life. Let unforgiveness not even be upon me. Help me, God, to walk according to the precepts and the concepts of your word. I don't see what's so hard about that. But you're more worried about the, the whole world crashing and all the apocalyptic things. You better worry about your judgment day with God. Is anybody here? You could balance it all out. It's easy. It's just called walking with God. So he checks this out. He, so fire, do, yeah, you want to play with fire? Come on, man. Come on, Nate, dab in the back. You go, go get your matches because God's going to light you up. Mama always said, don't play with matches. You're going to get what? Burnt. Well, don't play with God. I said, don't play with God. I see, again, we don't think it can happen. Verse 3, then Moses said unto Aaron, this is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. He said, I'm burning them up for a reason. I destroy them and dispose of them for a reason. Number one, I'm God and I can. And they sinned against me and I told them not to. I told them don't do this and don't do it in front of the people. I'm establishing a law of first mention. I'm establishing my character. And I'm telling you this is what I want done. And I'll have it my way done or you'll be done. Well done. Anybody here today in Burger King, he's going to have it his way. See, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for grace. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for grace. I don't want this day to come, but this day is coming. I'm telling you as I'm standing here prophesying to you, this day is coming from exposure to disposal because God is going to have a day where ye will be sanctified and set aside to the nations of the earth and you will see his glory in an unprecedented measure and it's not going to be when his kingdom comes, it's going to be before. He will do this. Watch and see. And I don't want to be a part of the barbecue. Are you here? I don't want to see it. But we're going to. It's going to be. 
before our very eyes, and you're going to see some greats fall. They have to because they're in the way. They have to because they're giving witches brew and they're casting spells and they're damning souls of people telling you you can live any type of lifestyle you want. Do you think God Almighty is going to allow that continuously in the days and weeks and months and years to come? I don't think so. I think he will come to a place where he's finished with it and he's going to show you his glory. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You have to study the Bible. You cannot have the glory of God without the penalty of that glory. There's no, wherever his glory is, if there's something that is unclean, he devours it because his glory cannot exist in it. I'll show it to you in just a few minutes. Just hang on if you can tolerate me. Watch this. I will be sanctified. I underline, I underline that real good in my notes here. I will be sanctified. There ain't no doubt about it. And I say, Lord, sanctify yourself. That they come nigh me before all the people, and I will be glorified. Notice that he said because it's before all the people. I want everybody to know who I am. How does the people know? How do you know God is glorious if you can't get pastors to show you the glory? How do you know what the anointing feels like if you can't walk into the building and feel the anointing? See, the church is more confused and, and, and more desirous of the cozy, uh, warm, Tupperware feeling of a church. You know, Tupperware party, Avon party. Oh, the oh, I just felt so good being there. Rather than feeling the power of God that convicts you and changes you and says, I had an encounter with an almighty God. Something was said to me that rattled my core. Now that's church. Not the fuzzy, buzzy, ruzzy, whoa, I love you. That don't last. And that ain't going to help you stand before an almighty God. You know what that makes you do? Fall further into your sin. Then you start acting like everybody else. Then you find out, oh, there's a wine club in the church. Oh, then you find out there's a smoke shack. Come on, somebody. And then you find out they're doing this and doing that. Did you know the pastor swings? Yeah, he's a swinger. You think I'm funny. You think I'm laughing. You think it's the truth. And then it becomes nothing but a whorehouse. Now, you may not know it by everybody in the group, but there's a certain group that knows who's swinging. See, we're so professional at church, we can do this and live like whores. It's just church. It's just entertainment. My God, is that true? Yes. You're watching it all the time on your television. You have no idea. They partying down, laughing at you, taking your money. Are you just trying to love God and do the best you can, and over there swindling you? I said somebody, you have no idea. You have no idea what they're doing in the church. And they don't have to be on the high level, high flying level. It's in local churches. They all doing stuff. They got stuff going down, man. Now, this is easy. Yeah, all the guys got to do is get up there and give me some babble. Sing a couple songs, put out a bucket, take the cash in, close up shop, and go back to life. You say that happens? Yep. All the time, baby doll. And that's strange fire. And if you participate in that, if you condone that, if you're a part of that, if you accept that, if you overlook that, if you ignore that, you're a part of it. And you got to get out of it. You got to get out of it. I would rather you sit at the house and watch ministry that you can trust than to go into some whorehouse and go further into the abyss of life and think that God feels the same way of the culture of that church. And he doesn't. He's an almighty, holy God. 
and he's separate, and he wants you to walk in that separation. Now, listen, you, again, it's being, the devil misconstrues this and says, well, you got to walk this tightrope, and you got to walk so perfect, and you got to wear the white glove and have it always inspected in your life. I'm not talking about that because it's impossible. There's nobody perfect. But you can have a heart that's perfect towards God. You can have a heart that is bendable, moldable, foldable, usable. Here I am, God. I admit my deficiencies. I admit my addictions. To me, that's a greater disciple is somebody who's crawling their way to Christ rather than somebody who sticks their neck up and says, I have no sin. Well, you know what happens to the first person that sticks their neck up? They usually lose their head. And I will be sanctified in them that come unto, nigh unto me before all the people. I will be glorified, and Aaron held his peace. Yeah, I would too, Aaron. You just watched your boys get crispy creamed. <laughs> he shut his mouth. That's what you need to do sometimes. When you see God judging, leave it alone. When I tell you certain things about certain ministries, I don't have any glee in anything. I have pity. I have pity on them, their families. If they're caught in adultery or pedophilia or whatever it is, I, I have great pity. And I, and I feel for the sheep. Better hold your peace. You ought to deal with them. Verse 4, And Moses called Mashel and uh, Eleuth elephant the sons of Uzel the uncle of Aaron and said unto them come near <laughs> oh, I love this come near and carry your brethren <laughs> uh, before the congregation go get them you know it wouldn't be hard to find out where they were just look for the ashes. Come get your brother <laughs> for before the congregation, lest you die. Now notice this. You say, well, that, you know, that was just Old Testament, and God was just being mean. God's the same. He never changed. He's a consuming fire. He never changes. This is the same God today. You know, in Acts chapter 5, they did the same exact thing. Give me a New Testament example, Pastor. Okay, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost, dead. What happened? They picked them up and buried them. What a church service that was. <laughs> Worship service and a funeral all in one. Could you imagine you showed up late and you walk in and they're carrying somebody out? What was that about? Well, I was deacon so-and-so. I told you. I told you he was playing poker on the side and playing around. <laughs> what I miss? Hold on. Here comes his wife. Is anybody here? Make light of it, but it was a serious thing. And what happened? It was at the time of the peak of the glory of God in the house of God in the beginning days of the church. And therefore, God was showing forth who he was. He was setting a standard saying, this is how you will worship me. This is how you will tell the truth. This is what you will do in my house or I will remove you. New Testament. After the cross. Grace. Grace. So don't give me none of this cycle babble you've been taught all these years, this mush mash in your brains theologically that God doesn't respond this way. Yes, he does, and yes, he will, especially when it's time for the glory. I'm trying to get you to see this. If you're crying out for revival, oh, God, give me the glory. I want to see you, brother. You don't know what you're asking for. You don't, I'm listen to me now. You're looking for goosebumps and goose eggs. You're looking for floating stuff. You're looking for charismatic. <laughs> That's what you're looking for. 
You're looking for flower child kumbaya. This is great. I love church. Oh, no. No, 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 no. That's not what the glory is going to do. Oh, will there be joy? There will be joy beyond you can imagine. You'll be laying on the ground rolling, laughing, enjoying God, his presence, and all that will be beautiful. But I'm going to tell you something. When his true, pure glory comes, there is a house cleaning with it because he's not going to light upon it on dirt. It always is very specific when the coming of the king that you do what? You clean the floor. You clean the highway. You prepare it and make it a highway of what? Holiness. There's too much to that to preach on in this little bit of time. But we don't see that. No, because we want the glossy, charisma, TBN, Christian magazine, Christian movie, Christian television uh, view of God. That's not how it works. It works according to Bible. And when God shows up, he shows off, and he will be sanctified. He said, man, you make God sound to be really rough. Well, he is in many aspects, but that's who he is, and he has the right to be. And he has the ability to be loving. And he has the ability to be angry. He has the ability to, all of those attributes, God can do it. And watch this. He knows how to do it in just measure. Now, I can't do all that. I'm either one extreme or the other. If I get mad, I'm really mad. Come on, somebody. We can't control our emotions. But God, he's, he don't go flip off and just say, ah, you, you're dead. <laughs> I mean, what would we? Dave, you're late again. I mean, you know, what would that be? What, what do you, I wouldn't want to serve him like that. Scared of him every time I got out of bed. Are you here? That's not how he is. He's measured. He's tempered. He's loving. He's all of those things. But I'm trying to get you to see the pureness of his glory of when it comes and how it will come. We're offering strange fire in the house of God. And we gotta get we gotta get it out of us. I gotta move on. I got about ten thousand more scriptures. Watch this. And it shall be, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Let this be a warning to you. Do you see that? Let that, they just carried them out. Let that be your warning that you may put, watch this. Here's the reason why God did it. If he, if he wanted to say, because I was mad and I had a bad day and I wanted to kill him and I thought it was cool, he would have wrote that. Do you know that? He's God. And we would have read it today and went, Wow. You, you are angry. He didn't do it that way because that's not him. Let's see what he says. So don't let the devil and theologians misconstrued God and misrepresent it. What did he say? We'll go to the book. And that he, ye may put difference between holy and the unholy. I did that to show you what's right and wrong. And between clean and unclean. Duh. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scholar, but I can read that. He basically said, I did this to show you what's right from wrong, and I ain't playing. Again, I'm glad for amazing grace. I'm glad God is temperament. He's, he's, he's cool, man. But I'm telling you, there's coming a day when God says that's it. It's funny to me. It's okay for us to say, go get them, God. Kill all those pagans and get them. And call fire down. But then whenever we tell you the message that God's going to do it to the house, oh, no, oh, no, not us angels. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You see that? It's a double standard. God's not a respecter of person. He'll reign on the just and the unjust. 
If you're in the way, he'll take you out of the way. He's big enough. He's sovereign. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're nobody to an almighty God. And see, I, the church has lost this because we've become a God ourselves. And Paul said, your belly has become your God. In other words, you stuff yourself with life and self-centeredness that you think now you're in control and this is the center of it all. You're wrong. It was the grace of God that woke you up out of your sleep with breath. How do you know you would have been dead or alive? You wouldn't know because you'd either be dead or alive. And guess what? You woke up, you're alive. Did you do that? Did you do that, honey? If you did that, you're awesome. Then you found the fountain of life. You found the ability to do it. No. You went to sleep, and your heart kept beating. Your blood kept running through the veins. You didn't have an aneurysm or a stroke or a heart attack. You didn't wake up paralyzed. You put both feet on the ground as hard as it was. You got up. Every creak and crack in your body, but you got up. You didn't do that. Oh, your spinal cord and your brain system and your electrons and your neutrons and your protons and please. In you, in him, we live and move and have our being. See, that's the core of Christianity, the core of life saying, I owe you everything. How do you walk in the house of God? How do you walk in life arrogant? You did this, and your job, and your brains, and your school, and your education, and your skills, and the, are you, are you serious? That doesn't mean you walk around, oh my God, I'm alive, thank God he's got me alive. That's ridiculous. It just makes me recognize and realize that I owe him everything. And how could I live a life of strange fire? How could I have hidden pet sins when he sees it all? And then arrogantly and hypocritically walk around like there's nothing wrong with me. That's strange fire. You need to get it out of your house. You need to get it out of your home. And you can hate me for the rest of your days by this message, but I'm telling you it will haunt you for eternity if you don't do it. And I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. I don't even know how much time I got left. How much time? Ten minutes? That is a lie. That is a lie. All right, watch this. That you may put the difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel. He just answered it. All the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. How many all know that was the best illustrated sermon you could ever see? I believe in Acts chapter 5, that was the greatest sermon ever preached by Peter. I want you to go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. As I make an attempt to finish this message, which in reality is impossible to finish. But as I was being ministered to by the Holy Ghost, He led me to the understanding that strange fire will lead you to the lake of fire. And I want to read this to you. <clears throat> as only the word of God can dictate truth because it is truth and I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon and the serpent the old serpent which is the devil and Satan 
Notice all the names given so you would not be mistaken who he's talking about. And he bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Can somebody say amen to that? And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Does everybody believe that so far? Till the thousand years be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones of they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or on, in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Somebody say amen. In verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath pardoned the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power. You ain't got no power over me, devil. But they shall be the priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog, and Magog, there are two of those, by the way, to gather them together, the battle of the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And what fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. He don't like that, does he? He still answers by fire. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Why? Because there's only a sovereign God. Not even his creation could stand in the glory of who he is. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Strange fire. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not found written, and the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. These words are true because of the words of God. This event will happen because it already happened in the mind of God. And if you think that you have an escape route You better judge yourself how you live. There are too many stories in the Word of God that shows that people who use self-righteousness as a cloak found out it didn't work in the end. I'm challenging this church and those that are watching right now, wherever this message would go worldwide, to check your heart for strange fire to remove from you those things, the impurities of life that hinder you from relationship with God. You know what those things are. I don't. 
I'm not your priest. You go to the high priest, you say, God, I struggle with this. I need your help. Create in me a clean heart, create in me clean hands, O God, that I may not sin against you. And where I'm wrong, help me to make it right. God will never cast you away when you make an effort such as that. But when you're stiff-necked and a worker of iniquity, he will deal with you, either now or later. I would rather him deal with me now. If you're watching me right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the lake of fire does not have to be your final reservation. The second death does not have to be for you. You could be a part of the first resurrection. But you have to fall in love with the resurrection. And his name is Jesus Christ. It's that simple. The church has made it so hard to reach heaven, but it's not. It's right at your heart and your mouth. Confess with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord, and your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life, and you will be with him forever. What a dream. What a promise. It's the truth. If you're backslid and this message has affected you in some way, some form, some fashion, you know you're a worker of iniquity. You know you operate in strange fire. Let's put that fire out. Let's let the Holy Ghost burn once again in your heart. It's that simple, but you've got to do it. God won't do it for you. Is there anybody in this room here that needs a touch from God? You need a financial breakthrough, physical, whatever it may be. Those that are watching right now, I'll pray the prayer of faith over you, and God will deliver you. Father, thank you for this time, this message. I know it's a harsh message. I know it's a hard message. I know it's a message that goes against the very grain of this culture here in America. But I know it's truth because your word declares it. May we all corporately and personally extinguish the strange fires in our lives. May we take inventory and judge ourselves lest we be judged by you. Lest we find ourselves in the whiplash of your fury and displeasure as fire falls on this nation. In so many forms it's coming. It will be beyond our imaginations. But I thank you, Father, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you'll protect us and provide for your people. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and may your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Everybody, I love you. Be blessed, and I'll see you Wednesday.